Well, hello again guys, it's Mathsmus, and today I am, for some reason, deciding to do another video on an 8x8 armoured personnel carrier slash armoured fighting vehicle. Honestly, I get a little bored of seeing these vehicles, this market, because there's just so many different variants, such a huge market um, and niche for these vehicles that it just gets a little boring. However, I thought, you know what, follow trend, people have been asking um, vehicles for me to review, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. So today we are looking at the FNSS PARS vehicle, which is an 8x8 armoured personnel carrier slash infantry fighting vehicle. Now, as I mentioned before, there is a huge market for these vehicles, and I honestly think that the future of track vehicles will eventually become very, very competitive with these vehicles. Uh, there's definitely a market for the two specifically, but it feels like to me that this market is definitely starting to take over a lot of customers that are used to buying tracked vehicles. So let's go over the vehicle specifications. It doesn't really have much of a history because it's so new and its features and then my final opinion on it. The PARS is a new generation wheeled amphibious armoured combat vehicle being designed and manufactured by FNSS Savunuma Systemleri. FNSS. This is a Turkey for Turkish Armed Forces vehicle and is also designed for international markets. The vehicle was developed with special emphasis on areas of mobility, protection, payload and growth potential. The vehicles employ the latest designs and technology from commercial automotive industries which have pretty much been militarized to meet the performance and durability of most modern military equipments. Now honestly the operational requirements of this vehicle are quite specific, obviously it's a lighter vehicle than a track vehicle so it can be dropped off in aircraft and all that good stuff, it's a lot quicker and mobile than a track vehicle for the most part, but I will always sight towards my tracks. The vehicles are based on a system of vehicles to include the 6x6, 8x8 and 10x10 which uses specific significant commonalities of each vehicle subsystem. Therefore, it's going to reduce the logistical footprint, so to speak, and the life cycle cost of the vehicle. These vehicles are being built in two different configurations, namely the PARS 6x6 and the PARS 8x8. It can easily be transported in air by a C-130, the PARS 6x6, an A-400, a C-17 and a C-5 Galaxy. Remember, the 6x6 is pretty much the most lightweight vehicle configuration of this to be able to do that. The 8x8 will not. Two crew members, a driver and a commander, are seated in the front section of the cockpit to control the vehicle. Based on different configurations, the vehicle can accommodate the PARS 6x6, 8 to 11, and the PARS 8x8, 13 to 16 personnel configurations. The Mobile Amphibious Assault Bridge, or MAB, configuration of the vehicle was scheduled to enter service with the Turkish Armed Forces in 2012. The MAB for the Turkish Land Forces signed in early 2007. However, the MAB system is based on the PARS 8x8 and the suspension elements of the PARS are used in this vehicle as well. FNSS has received an order of up to 1,000 PARS armoured vehicles for the Turkish Army. The Turkish Navy will procure 50 amphibious PARS vehicles. PARS 6x6 is one of the three known contenders for the Turkish Land Forces Command or TLFC requirement for 336 6x6 reconnaissance vehicles in five versions which are Command, Support, Sensor, Radar and CBRE or MBC or I guess if you don't know what that stands for, Nuclear, Biological and Chemical Reconnaissance Vehicles. The baseline PARS 8x8 vehicle has a hull consisting of steel armour. The driver and commander are seated in a cockpit at the front of the vehicle side by side, which is supposed to give better communication, but honestly, I just don't see the point in it. Each has a single roof piece hatch that opens to the side. Both have access to the flat panel displays on which all relevant information is shown. The seating arrangement depends on the role, but the troops are normally seated on individual seats down each side of the hull facing inwards. These shock absorbing seats are fitted with five extra seat point belts as standard. A large ramp fitted to the rear section will be used for entry and exit of troops, however it only opens halfway down and once again I find this to actually be more of a hazard than it is to just open all the way left or right or actually have a drop to the floor ramp. The modular design of the PARS will incorporate external turrets or weapon stations depending on the user requirements. It could be a one or a two man turret or a remotely operated weapon station. To allow for PARS to be rapidly configured for different operational roles, all members of the PARS family have removable roofing so they can be quickly converted for a wide range of specialist roles. The development of the PARS vehicles commenced in 2002. PARS 6x6 is being proposed for the Turkish Army and the PARS 8x8 was first developed in February 2005 during the IDX Defence Equipment Exhibition held in Abu Dhabi. Since the first PARS vehicles were shown in 2005, development and further enhancements has been carried out on a continual basis. The PARS 8x8 vehicle was examined by the Malaysian Army in 2006, competing with the Swiss Piranha IIIC and the Finnish Patria AMV. 
It was demonstrated in the deserts of the UAE in 2008, covering 11,000 kilometers of desert and road trials. Furthermore, testing was then again carried out in the UAE deserts in 2010. The PARS 8x8 vehicle is fitted with a 25mm gun turret and was also successfully tested by another Middle Eastern country in the summer of 2010. The PARS armoured vehicle will feature a V-shaped hull, 4 axles, 4 access doors and a trapezoidal block, 2 lighthouses, an automatic drivetrain management system and a 2.2kW auxiliary power unit. There's also a self-recovery hydraulic winch and 8 wheels to be independently suggested on each side to the height that is requested. The vehicle will have a rectangular shaped shell equipped with a built-in headlights on the hull which will be fitted to the gearbox comprising of 6 forward gears and 1 reverse gear. The vehicle can be equipped with a wide range of armaments, from the 7.62mm MG to air defence guns and missile systems depending on the user requirements and the specifications that are requested by the military buying it. The PARS is already fitted with a 25mm FNSS sharpshooter turret which can fire munitions at a rate of around 200 rounds per minute. Due to a high axle capacity of the vehicle, weapon systems such as two-man turrets, the 120mm, mortar systems, air defence guns, missile systems and 90mm turrets can also be fitted on this vehicle. One of the most significant features of the PARS vehicles is its situational awareness. Now, a lot of people have spoke to me in the past about this. Matt must do a video on why they shouldn't use cameras and why they should just use people looking at a turret or you know, periscopes and such, and honestly, I am on the side of computers and looking through camera screens, but there's an extent of which I'll go with that. The PARS vehicles include a unique feature where the vehicle command and drivers sit side by side. I don't honestly think this is unique, I think it's just part and parcel of what happens when you design a vehicle like this, it's almost like a truck. For enhanced visibility, there are two thermal cameras on the front and the rear, as well as two optical cameras at the front and rear also. Local situational awareness is significantly enhanced with this capability, however, if these cameras go down, you are in a lot of trouble and you're back to square one using periscopes anyway. Visual images are displayed on two large flat panel screens located in the front and where the driver and commander sit. The screens also display vehicle location through its GPS system as well as status and fault information on the vehicle systems themselves. 7 to 11 large periscopes are fitted to the what's now known as the cockpit of this vehicle at the front of the vehicle for the driver and commander to view their surroundings and to provide a side-by-side -side space for either to operate the vehicle left and right hand drive. Now honestly I don't see the point in having to operate the vehicle left or right hand drive. I've been in the British Army when I drove vehicles I had no problem transferring to left and right side of the road in a left or right sided vehicle. It's part and parcel of being in a you know multinational force, you get used to it, it's good experience. Protection for the PARS vehicle system is mainly achieved through the design of the vehicle hull. Obviously with the V-shaped hull it is very very capable of being able to defend itself against IEDs, mines and roadside bombs. The vehicle is renowned for its high mobility and that's really what they were trying to focus on when designing this vehicle. It comes from its newly developed active pneumatic independent suspension system. The vehicle is equipped with an independent suspension at all wheel stations, which provides commonality between each station, thereby reducing logistics and improving life cycle costs. The pneumatic suspension system is electronically controlled and allows for ground clearance to be set for optimal performance. The vehicle's variable height suspension enables the vehicle to hide behind obstacles to reduce enemy visibility. The vehicle also has a massive selection of tyre sizes that it can use. The PARS vehicle enhanced mobility is aided by a suspension travel of 450 millimeters, full all-wheel drive incorporating automatic driveline management as well as central tyre inflation and anti-lock braking systems. The PARS vehicle has an effective all-wheel steering system that is equally well suited to high-speed driving on say highways or motorways or manoeuvring in tight narrow urban streets. All of this high-performance steering capability and off-road capability is done quite simply and automatically for the driver and is transparent to him in the operation of the vehicle, basically meaning when he's operating it he has no idea what the vehicle is doing, it's just going to do it for him automatically. That's handy because sometimes it's nice to know that the vehicle is going to take over, but in my personal opinion, being an armoured fighting vehicle driver, I don't like that the computer is taking over certain aspects of your vehicle. I like the feel of the road, I like the feel of the train and knowing what your suspension is doing, but that's coming from a tracked vehicle uh, driver and of course it's going to be very different to driving an all-wheeled vehicle like this. The PARS can accomplish a maximum road speed of 100 km an hour. The vehicle can travel at 3 km an hour during low speed manoeuvring and it is designed to forward a depth of up to 1.5 meters. The vehicle can also cross river at a speed of around 8 km an hour using optional hydrojets. 
Now this is quite important because once again this is what this vehicle was poised for, its mobility and its maneuverability across any terrain and crossing rivers is a very very important part of that, you know, we want to make sure the vehicle can get where it needs to go. In terms of survivability then, the crew in the vehicle front and in the vehicle rear have independent suspension on their seat, which basically allows for, if an IED goes off, it's basically going to prevent the blast shock waving up through your body and actually injuring yourself, which is one of the biggest concerns whilst deployed in Afghanistan. I was always scared to death of a mine blast going up my warrior seat, it would have ripped my spine in half and I have seen horrible injuries of guys having those things happen. The blast not actually getting to the vehicle or through the vehicle, but the shockwave is actually doing some severe damage to people's spines and necks. This vehicle has its own independent seating system which allows you to actually not have to worry about that, which is really really cool. That is actually a standard on most vehicles nowadays, they realized and learned from Afghanistan that this is not the way it should be. We should be protecting our infantry, there's no point in dropping them off with, you know, broken spines, bad backs, bad necks, if you know, you get in there and they just have no capability to fight. Survivability is very, very important on modern armored fighting vehicles nowadays, and as I mentioned, they have learned their lesson from Afghanistan, and I'm really glad to see that this vehicle has followed suit, and it'd be very surprising nowadays if vehicles didn't just keep it as a standard feature. Overall, guys, I've got to admit, I'm pretty impressed with this vehicle, but as I said many times in the past, when it comes to these 8x8 and 6x6 vehicles, the market is just flooded with them. It's as if track vehicles have literally been brought out of the minds of any ministry of defense or any defense network or government i understand the principle of why they're going down that route it is cheaper in the long you know in the long haul it's preventing them to uh, have to put tons of money into track maintenance which honestly guys costs a lot of money i understand the defense against roadside blasts and all that good stuff shaped hulls but honestly, I do feel like the wheeled market is really starting to overtake the track market and I will actually be doing a specific video on this in the near future discussing my, I guess, <laughs> concerns and gripes with this particular mentality that's coming out in the military world nowadays with wheeled and tracked vehicles. Now I will admit I'm a little biased towards tracked vehicles for the fact that I was a tracked vehicle operator, however I'm moving into an army where wheels are the best thing in the world, the LAV-3 obviously from the Canadian military side of things, um, and this is one of those vehicles that's eventually going to start replacing some of the older variants of the wheeled vehicles out there. I've got to admit I really do appreciate the fact of how much they've considered mobility on this vehicle. At the end of the day if you're going to make a wheeled vehicle you better make sure that it is completely mobile in every sense of the word, whether it be independent wheel suspension, um, you know, being able to turn tightly. This management system is a little strange to me, I've never really heard of that before, independent, um, you know, steering management, it kind of just takes over, and like I said, in my own personal opinion, I wouldn't like that, I would like to feel the vehicle's uh, feedback, I wouldn't want all these computers and electronics taking over systems, you've got to remember with electronics, it's just like trucks. Uh, out here in Canada when people buy trucks they buy these really fancy electronic trucks and yes they're great but give it 10 years let's see how long those electrics last especially in the conditions they're put in in military vehicles it would be interesting to see how well they do in terms of survivability it's definitely got some some good capabilities obviously it's designed for roadside blasts we've gone through this uh, many many times with other vehicles I Gotta say though, I don't really see much protection through those vision blocks. I'm a little concerned that a well placed RPG is going to put some real damage on those crew members in that uh, cockpit, as they call it. It does have, um, I noticed, 16 smoke discharges, which I've always said is definitely um, a really, really big thing for me. I love extra smoke discharges, and on my Warrior, I mean, I only had uh, two sets of, of four, so I didn't really have much option to really. Um, you know, provide much more smoke screen than eight tubes. This thing is covered in them, and I think that's definitely a nice feature to have. The vehicle being um, so long is definitely something you'd have to be careful of with bottoming this vehicle out, you know, going over a knife edge or something like that, but and you never know, maybe the suspension system's able to even get it higher than the, the knife edge to get it over, I don't know. Anyway, I really enjoy this vehicle, and I hope you really enjoyed this video. Please leave me a like, guys, and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of this vehicle overall. I must admit, I am sad to see the day of armed fighting vehicles slowly progressing more to wheels than they are tracks, but it is what it is. Let me know what you think about the vehicle and the video in the comments section below, and if you wish to support my channel, I'd really, really appreciate you checking out my Patreon account, and uh, check out Facebook also. Coming up soon, guys, I've been doing some collabs um, with some other military YouTubers out there, British veteran YouTubers, and I would love it if you could maybe get involved with us and our network, and some of the other people that are involved with this particular group. More details to follow, just stand by for it, but uh, it's definitely coming. Anyway, once again, thanks for watching, take care, and bye-bye.